Thank you, and thank you for staying late. Um, those who won't would be able to watch it. As, as Alon would say, if you were here, you would be able to watch it on YouTube, especially in Japan. So uh, this work is about contextual recommendations in multi-user devices with uh, a bunch of folks from, from Yahoo. So what is this uh, all about? Um, you all know recommendations, so you see them everywhere. Um, and typically, when recommendations are for a particular user's account or in a particular private device, we all understand how they work. So for example, someone's Amazon account could show an experience like this, recommending books for a person. Or um, my LinkedIn account recommends some groups I might be able to join. Of course, LinkedIn knows a lot about me and who my collaborators are, who my colleagues are. Um, a cat who owns a laptop might get recommendations for a great can of cat food. Because again, this is this cat's laptop. And of course, we all know that um, our smartphones are really a, an extension of ourselves. And um, the smartphone knows a lot about us. So recommendations on personal accounts or personal devices are pretty well understood. But then what happens when actually uh, either it's a shared account or a shared device? So for example, now two cats are sharing a tablet. And, and the tablet does not always know which cat it is that is using it and uh, what to recommend. Or two kids might be sharing uh, a game console such as Xbox, which is really a recommendation platform by Microsoft. So again, who is using the Xbox at any point in time um, and what to recommend? And this is a classic example from the web, uh, a complaint by a person who, uh, as you can see, is a 34-year-old man who enjoys action and sci-fi. And this is what his children did to his Netflix account. <laughs> so this is all pretty uh, daunting. So you know, recommendation is all about knowing who the person is that we are trying to recommend to, but now, there might be multiple people there um, who are using some account or some device, and we need some methodology to understand who it is and what to recommend. Now, this specific work that I'm going to present is about a specific application in this space, and it is about recommendations for smart TVs. So the main point you need to understand about smart TVs today is that they can track what is being watched on them, but they cannot yet track who is watching them. So even though people are starting to talk about TVs with little cameras that can scan the living room and understand who is watching, those are not yet on the market. And so basically the main problem in TV recommendation today is to infer who has consumed each content item in the past and then also who is the person currently in front of the TV who needs the recommendation. And I'm talking about a person, but actually the who and these two bullets can be a subset of users. It can be uh, you know, any, any combination of members of a household can watch TV together, and their tastes might be different than those that they would have exhibited had they watched TV alone or in different subsets. So this is really the problem at hand. Now, um, there are known approaches how to solve recommendations uh, in, in you know, these types of cases. And the basic idea is to use some more context. So it's not only to know that this TV device um, has been used in the past to watch these programs. Some extra context can come into play and help us. So for example, a recommendation system might recommend Good Morning America at uh, 7.30 in the morning under the assumption that um, the reasonable audience for that program would be an adult having the morning coffee. At 3 p.m., they might, uh, the system might recommend Dora. Uh, on account of probably kids watching it at um, 6, uh, almost 6 p.m., especially on the West Coast on Mondays, you might have a recommendation for Monday Night Football for the guys coming back from, from work. And late night, you might just give a recommendation for a nice horror movie for this type of audience. Okay, so context is very helpful um, and can disambiguate to some extent who are the probable users of the device at any point in time? This, this example is about temporal context, but other type of contexts can certainly also occur. So um, I'll actually focus about what we call sequential context, which is given the current item being watched on the TV, what should the recommender system recommend next? Now, you can clearly imagine that if someone is watching SpongeBob on the device, 
it is fair to assume that it's those same kids from two slides ago and recommend them Dora. Whereas on the other hand, if someone is watching uh, uh, specifically uh, a graphic uh, Game of Thrones episode, that might be the same type of audience who would enjoy a horror movie. Okay, so whatever is being watched now on the device can teach us a lot about who are likely to be the people watching that device and what should we target uh, them next with. And specifically, uh, this work looks at uh, what we call the watch it next problem um, on smart TVs. And it's formulated as follows. You know what time it is and you know which device it is. And of course, you're familiar with the entire history of the device and all the other devices um, in, in the universe. And so you know that this specific device is watching a specific episode of Heart, House of Cards at a specific time. And uh, the question is, what should be recommended now to be watched next on this device, say, at the top of the hour? And there's an implicit assumption in all of this that there's a pretty decent chance that whoever the composition of the sofa in front of the TV is right now, that same composition of people will remain there for the next program. So if we can take the time and the sequential context, the currently watched show, and somehow reason about who our likely audience is, there's a good chance we'll be able to produce good recommendations. Now, if we want to go technical uh, a bit, think of it as a hidden Markov model, where the hidden variables or state corresponds to who is watching the set in the sofa, and the states don't change too often, okay? Of course, sometimes people come and go, um, but you know, with a very good chance, someone sitting in front of the TV would watch two or more items in a row. Okay, so the watch it next inputs and outputs. So as I said, uh, we have a device, we know its history, we have the time, we have the currently watched show. What we also have, because this is TV, we have what's called a lineup. We know what might be shown next uh, on the set of channels that are available. So, you know, could be any one of those shows. And the target of the system is to come up with a ranking um, where most likely uh, the system would show newsroom to the watchers of House of Cards. And if not that, maybe a football game or Game of Thrones or last, uh, Dora, at least in this example. Okay, so this is the setting. This is what we want to achieve. And um, now it's a good time to take a little bit of a step back and talk a little bit about technicalities and a little bit of um, algorithms. So um, one particular characteristic of TV, of TV recommendations is the following. If we looked at previously the example from Amazon. <clears throat> On Amazon, people don't typically buy the same book twice, nor do they typically read the same news article twice. However, uh, people do listen to movie, to listen to songs they like over and over and over again, and uh, watch movies over and over again. And in TV, they regularly watch series and sports events. So there are two distinct and very important uh, settings of recommendations in the TV space. The first is the habitual setting, where all lineup items are eligible for recommendation to a device, even items that the device has already watched or people from that household have already consumed. Uh, you know, people like to watch reruns of Seinfeld. Why they do that, I don't know, but they do. So that would all fi fall under the habitual setting in which every item in the lineup is fair game for the system. But there's also the exploratory setting where only items that were not previously watched on the device are eligible for recommendation. And this represents items that um, would be new to household members or to the device owners. And actually sometimes people are interested in, you know, they ask the system to surprise them, to give them something new that they're not familiar with yet. So these are distinct and we'll see later that results for these two settings are also different. Now I'm going to take uh, a slight detour and talk about contextual recommendations in a different context. And this is a context of web browsing. As you can see, this is um, an article page at some media site. Uh, media site happens to be Yahoo. Um, and there's a story here about someone cooking up a pretty big cheeseburger. And there are three sort of recommendation modules around here. This one is contextual. So this says, 
explore related content, related content to the big cheeseburger. There is also a popular module over here, things that uh, are trending but might have nothing to do with a cheeseburger. And up there you also see news for you, which is supposedly personalized. And the question we now want to take uh, the talk to is whether you can combine contextualization and personalization and basically get recommendations that um, have both angles represented in them, okay? Both contextualized and personalized. So let's go back to the Amazon experience and talk about the basic technique or one of the two basic techniques in recommendations today, which is collaborative filtering. So this is a fundamental principle in recommender systems. And basically what these techniques do, they tap similarities in how users consume content. Um, consume content or enjoy content, it depends on the specific system and what its inputs are. But basically what it tries to do is to recommend to a user what other users who have exhibited in the past similar consumption or enjoyment patterns have enjoyed. Okay, so this is the basic idea. We'll talk a little bit about the mathematical abstraction. Uh, I promise you uh, very few, maybe just one formula. Um, so the mathematical abstraction is just consider a matrix R of users by items and we have uh, little green spots where users have consumed items. And um, this matrix is typically very sparse. Most users consume just a small, tiny portion of the available set of items and is often very large. I mean, this is a big data day. I mean, we can't talk about small sets here. And the real life task that underlies recommendation is what's called top K recommendation. Recommend to a user the top list of K items, K might be three, five, maybe 10, that the system believes this user should consume. And a related task, on, uh, especially on ratings data, is matrix completion, where uh, you just pick a white spot there and try to guess what would this user, um, or how would this user rate that item. And technically, the, um, uh, one of the ways to solve these types of problems is with latent factor models where you try to map both users and items to a small or a low dimensional space and uh, basically produce some items, some f-dimensional user items and f-dimensional item, item, uh, item vectors that their um, <coughs> multiplication sort of reflects the input matrix. And of course, the main problem is to find a mapping of users and items to these low dimensional vectors that will produce good estimates. Now, this is closely related to dimensionality uh, reduction techniques. And actually, uh, Sham's previous talk um, did a great service to me. It sort of gave a little bit of background on what these things sort of do. Now, uh, you can ask, are these techniques any good? Well, they are. Latent factor models were extensively used by the team that won the Netflix challenge in 2009 and have proven to be highly successful in many recommendation settings over the years. So this is not just um, an excuse to use algebra. This algebra does work. Okay, another uh, tool, and again, the previous talk did a great job in sort of presenting this, is um, latent uh, Dirichlet allocation or LDAs. Topic models, basically. So think, uh, again, if I, if I go back to where this originated from, it originated as a generative model for creating documents. So we could have uh, documents containing words, and you have this big matrix of how many times did each word appear in each document. And again, you can try to decompose that matrix into the product of two low-dimensional matrices uh, where each document is associated with um, a k-dimensional row vector and each, in this case, uh, what will be interpreted as a topic with a k-dimensional vector. And basically the interpretation is that k, the dimension that we reduce this matrix to, is the number of topics in the corpus. And we have here two stochastic matrices representing the probability of a topic to be represented in a document and uh, a probability of words to be exhibited in the document given a topic. Okay, and then L is the, the length. 
So why are we talking about LDAs? Why are we talking about topic models? We're talking about them because when we say there is a TV in the household, and the household might have different people in it with different tastes, and perhaps combination of people exhibit tastes, to us, those combinations of people in the household are the topics. They are, in this case, the available profiles in the household, and um, the words are the shows. So basically, we're, we reduce the problem we have from talking about uh, documents and words to talking about devices and shows, and then the K profiles, which previously were topics, are just now different combination of users of the device, um, and every device has a distribution over who are the different profiles that use it. Now, what we want is that the profiles, we want the profiles to have some semantic interpretation. So we want um, to have profiles that represent preferences such as kids' shows, or cooking reality and home improvement, or news and late night, or history and science, or, you know, redneck reality. So we're trying to group different shows uh, together in a manner that makes sense that we can sort of envision who in the household would be associated with each type of profile and what are the shows or programs that are um, intuitively popular with each of these uh, profiles, okay? And then, uh, of course, the probability of an item being watched on a device is just you sum over the K profiles and you multiply the probabilities of an item given a profile and the profile given the device. Okay, this is uh, the one and only, well, one of two formulas in the top. Okay, so we have these two building blocks. We have the latent factor models, we have the LDAs. Now we sort of want to use them to solve our watch it next problem. So there are three main approaches to contextualizing recommendations. One is just pre-filter your data. You want to recommend to kids, somehow understand when kids watch the devices, throw all the other uh, data points you have away, just focus on data points representing kids' watching preferences, and learn that. Okay, so, so that's pre-filtering. There is also the post-filtering. Uh, learn whatever you have, and then just do some post-processing, um, augmenting and reducing scores based on the current context. So for example, if you know that a certain show is more popular at daytime than it is at nighttime, reduce its night score a little bit because, you know, it's not popular at night. And then there is contextual modeling where you try to weave the context into the model itself. Um, it seems like this would be the most accurate thing to do. However, it comes at a cost. You, it requires much more data because there are many more variables to solve for, and it's also obviously more computationally intensive. Now, um, an example of that, of that was tensor factorization. We're back to tensors again. The next, the previous talk did a great service here. I'm not going to go into details, but this is the type of stuff that goes on when you try to incorporate context into the model. What we're trying to use here is some trick that avoids any of those, um, of those techniques earlier. We're trying to use what we call a three-way technique, and the principle is the following. So just use standard matrix factorization. It doesn't matter if it's an LFM or an LDA model, and um, represent your 2D matrix as a product of two low-dimensional matrices. Then, when recommending something, or when trying to recommend a show to a device D that is currently watching some context item C, what you want to do is you want to score each target item as follows. So, the score of target item T following context item or show C given a device D is you go over your K topics, you take the entry corresponding to D multiplied by the entry corresponding to T, which is what happens in LDA and LFM by default, but you also multiply the corresponding element in the context item, okay? You just take your inner product, and instead of inner producting two vectors, you just add the third vector in there. So you have uh, a three-way multiplication. 
that's basically it. That's the entire idea. Um, now, there's a technical def uh, detail here that uh, you can read, and if it makes sense to you, that's fine. If it doesn't, don't, don't worry about it. Um, and this results in what we call sequential LFM or sequential LDA, which is a personalized, contextualized recommender. It's personalized because it's using um, the user latent vector and the target item latent vector, but it's also contextualized because it's using the context item vector. And uh, basically, the score will be high or low for targets that agree both with the context and with the device. Now again, the, the point here is that we're not doing contextual learning. We're just keeping everything simple. We're not bothering to model the context or to change the learning algorithm. We learn as usual and just apply this change when scoring the devices. And now let's see if it works. So what is the uh, data with which we experimented with this approach? Basically, it's triplets of the form a device, a program being watched, and a timestamp. Now, we don't know who watched the device at the time, and we don't even know if anyone was watching the device at the time, OK? Remember, all we have is what the smart TV is telling us, and the smart TV might be telling us that at a particular point in time, a channel changed, and then sometime changes, time passes, and a program change is detected. But if nobody pressed the remote control, we're not sure if someone is there. So our confidence that a person is still watching the next show diminishes as more and more show boundaries um, pass. And it could be that the person who has been watching TV is long asleep. We don't know. Okay, And this is, again, one of the problems in the smart TV space. Uh, before we have that camera there, we can't know who actually is watching. Um, we don't. The, you could imagine a setting where, yes, you could know that. I mean, you could imagine a situation where any remote control operation on the TV yeah. would record that a person did something. It's not in our data, though. That's a good question. Okay, so um, what data did we use? So we used about... Um, 340,000 devices who watched uh, about 17,000 unique items overall with more than 19 million of these triplets. A triplet is a device at a certain time watched a certain show. And then we tested uh, one month of viewership data, which basically um, had these triplets of this device is watching this show, and now guess what the next show is. So we had about 3.8 test instances in the habitual setting in which we are testing ourselves whether we can guess whether uh, the device watched something that it may have watched before or not. And then another 1.7 million cases where it's the exploratory setting and we're only being tested whether we if we can guess what is this new item that the device will watch that it has never watched before. Now, you can ask, um, I mentioned that there is a lineup. Yeah? Uh, I just want to know if you still program people recording uh, Absolutely. We have no idea if there is an actual channel that is showing this program right now, or whether someone has TiVoed the program, or um, used their setup box. Uh, it's all the same to us. It can also be a VOD service. So, and, and that's basically what blows up this number of unique items. So uh, definitely. Um, we have lineups. Uh, and basically, if we ask the question, how difficult is this guesswork? Uh, from among how many options does the recommender need to rank? So it's about 350 to 400 items, okay? There's a significant space of stuff people watch at any point in time, and, um, and it's, it's pretty large. Okay, uh, there's also a metric I need to talk to you about, and that's the metric by which we evaluate the recommendations quality, and it's called uh, average rank percentile. So what is the rank percentile? Again, let's, let's go back to the scenario we have. We have a device, we have a certain time, and we know that House, House of Cards is what's currently on the TV. We, we need to guess what will be watched next. So the system ranks all the shows 
from what it sees as most probable to what it sees as less likely. And now uh, we get the reveal. We get to know that actually what was watched next was the football game. So the football game is number two here on the list. Um, so it actually corresponds to the 75th percentile of uh, items when they're sorted by rank. In other words, uh, the top item would have been rank percentile one, and uh, you can see how this diminishes as the right answer was ranked lower by our algorithms. So basically, rank percentile uh, ranges in zero to one. Higher is, of course, better, and uh, random score, uh, a random algorithm would score about 0.5. Okay, if you could just do a random permutation of shows, and, and that what you would serve as recommendations, you would be at rank, rank percentile 0.5. Now, you might say this is a pretty strange metric, but it's not actually for large lineups, um, which we have. Uh, this is practically equivalent to the well-known area under curve metric. So um, it's pretty standard stuff. And now we tested a bunch of baselines with, uh, with the three-way approaches. The baselines range from just serve recommendations based on the general, general popularity of a show, or just serve based on the sequential um, popularity of a show. So what is the most popular show to watch after Seinfeld? What is the most popular show to watch after a football game? Temporal pop popularity, what is the most popular show being watched at 8.30 p.m.? Device popularity, what is the most popular show that this device watches? Um, and then baseline, meaning non-contextualized LFMs and LDAs. You can see that, that some of these are personalized, some of these are contextualized. None of these yet is both. So these are the baselines, and then the methods we tested that are both personalized and contextualized are sequential LDA and LFM. This is exactly that three-way computation I told you about earlier. You uh, take the user vector, the context item vector, and the target item vector, and just multiply all three of them element-wise and sum that up. There is temporal LDA or LFM where you do uh, the regular vanilla personalization, and then you post-process with temporal context or temporal popularity. And there is the temporal sequential LDA or LFM, which means do the three-way score and then use temporal popularity as a post-processor to get the temporal context in there. Okay, so basically uh, about nine different combinations of um, contextual and non-contextual, personalized and non-personalized, and a few that are both. Um, a note here, if you ask about dimensions, both LFM and LDA models were 80-dimensional. Um, it is what it is. Okay, so the first couple of results I want to show you just demonstrate how much context matters. Okay, so what you can see here is what happens in the metric average rank percentile if you just use uh, vanilla LFM or LDA, these are the red columns, or use um, the sequential LFM or LDA with the right currently watched context item, or you might say, it doesn't really matter that this item is being watched right now. You could have taken any item that this device watches and it would have worked the same way. So we also tried that. We also tried doing the same uh, sequential LFM and LDA with just a random item from the previous history of the device. Something that these users or this household has watched before. And you can clearly see that whether it's LFM or LDA, qualitatively, the results are the same. Using the right context definitely helps, and using random context is actually worse than using no context at all. Okay, so context certainly does have an influence here on the quality of recommendations. And if you think about this, this pretty much proves that this degradation when using just a random item as context sort of indicates that the correct context does reflect the viewing session or the people sitting on the sofa, okay? It implicitly does model whoever is currently watching the device. And if you're not convinced, um, let's see what this abstract painting is all about. So what you see here um, is 
the um, average rank percentile of LDA in red and sequential LDA in blue as a function of the device entropy. What is device entropy? So remember, what does LDA do? It basically takes a device, looks at all its history, and assigns that device probabilities of watching different types of shows. Now, basically, it's a distribution over 80 elements. And one can measure the entropy of that distribution to, to see whether this device is um, actually you know, a one-track mind, always watches sports shows, or whether it's a very random device that watches all types of shows uh, with very little regularity. And what we can see are two uh, facts. The first is totally uh, intuitive and not surprising. The more random the device is, the more it changes topics and genres and shows, the harder it is to predict what it watches. Okay, More randomness, harder to predict. No big surprise there. The second point is that using the sequential context actually uh, helps degrade much more gracefully. And you can see that the gap, as the device becomes more and more random or high entropy, the gap between sequential and vanilla LDA grows. So context matters, which is good. Um, so this is pretty much uh, how I define device entropy. Now let's move to how things actually work, actually look when we try to recommend. So um, in the exploratory setting, I remind you what this is. The exploratory setting only looks at um, context target sequences where the target item was never previously watched on the device. So this is about predicting um, what, what show a certain device will see given that we know that it has never seen it before. So, so from among all the stuff this device never watched before, what will it watch? So first we can see just you know the memory-based uh, non-personalized approaches. General popularity takes us very little above random. Sequential popularity, meaning just look at what tends to come after the context show, does a little bit better. Temporal popularity does pretty well, actually. And, and remember, some people do watch TiVo, and they do watch previously recorded shows, but most of the people, most of the time, watch something on what we call linear TV, something that is actually being broadcast right now. And broadcast um, lineups have very strong temporal uh, patterns. Okay, the news is always on at eight o'clock. Uh, cartoons are always on at three o'clock. Now let's move to um, what happens with LFM and LDA. And again, qualitatively, it's the same. We can see that the vanilla portion is um, a little bit better than just using any of these two general or sequential popularities. That will be this bar and this bar. And then sequential context makes it better. Temporal context makes it also even more better. And combining both temporal and sequential context is, um, gives the best results. Now, this is not surprising. Had this not been the case, I would not have been presenting this here. So this is... Um, this is pretty obvious and it's good. The same is also true for the habitual setting. Now, in the habitual setting, again, I, I want to remind you what this is. Every show is fair game, okay? The device might watch new stuff that it hasn't watched before. It might also watch uh, stuff that it watched previously, whether a lot, like uh, Seinfeld reruns, or just, you know, just once, like a movie that is being uh, watched for the second time. And again, we see that generally um, the non-personalized contextual models uh, can get you so far. And then personalization gets you a little bit higher and combining temporal and sequential is the best. So to conclude, um, multi-user and shared devices pose challenging uh, recommendation problems. They, they take what is a pretty well understood setting and they complicate it by forcing the recommender to try to reason about who is it from among the user or users of the device that now needs to consume recommendations. Um, 
Furthermore, TV recommendations also have this little uh, quirk about them that unlike news or unlike books, uh, people do watch certain shows over and over and over again, and so you need to balance between habitual viewership patterns and exploratory patterns. We can see that sequential context helps uh, because basically it narrows the topical variety of the program to be not watched next on the device. Given that sort of intuitively, it allows you to disambiguate which person or persons uh, is or are currently using or watching the device. The three-way technique is an effective way of using sequential context or incorporating it into the scoring model. And the nice thing about it is that it has absolutely zero impact on learning. You completely ignore the fact that you're going to use it in a three-way fashion when you learn. You learn the normal model, no context, without any regard that this is a multi-user device, and then just during scoring you can apply this trick. And for future, one uh, interesting uh, direction to pursue is trying to model the same problem using uh, hidden topic Markov models where um, basically these HTMMs are combinations of hidden Markov models and topic models. And the combination might prove particularly um, useful here because, again, uh, the topic sort of represents the, the current population viewing the device, and that population changes slowly. So that's about it. Uh, happy to take questions if you have them.